kids need. Um, as Mark introduced me uh, just a little bit, you know, with my contact info and a little bit about me. So I do host that the Neurodiversity Podcast. And so um, we've been around now, this is actually our fourth year that we've been um, producing the podcast. And uh, my husband does all of the audio production, which makes it, I think, really exceptional. He's very talented. Um, and so I would encourage you to check it out. You can get it wherever you find podcasts. And I will actually, at the end of this presentation, I'll have a list of some of the podcast episodes that we've done that have been specifically related to this topic that you might be interested in checking out. Um, I do, I, I am in the process, well, one book is fully written, tw Teaching Twice Exceptional Learners in Today's Classroom was written and um, supposed to be published this past year, but I think wisely, Free Spirit Publishing opted to push it back due to the pandemic. So it's going to be out this next fall. Um, and I have another book that I'm still in the process of writing, but it will also be out this fall, and that's through Proofrock Press, and that's more geared for parents of twice exceptional kids. So um, I'm excited about those two projects and, and seeing them really come to fruition. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, really the best place to find me, sorry, I know we're on Facebook, but I hang out a lot on Twitter, um, EmilyKM underscore LPC, or you can follow our podcast. Um, you can find us, we are on Facebook, and actually we do have a Facebook group that's associated with the podcast, which is still called the Mind Matters Gifted Ed um, and Advocacy Group. So if you want to join the conversation there, that would be great, or you can find our website. So with all of that, um, let's, let's just talk a little bit about the changes that we've seen in in anxiety just in general in the general population over the last you know 10 to 15 years um, you can see this is this is from um, data and statistics from the CDC um, and in 2007 five and a half percent of kids between the ages of three and 17 had a current diagnosis of some type of anxiety disorder so this might be um, generalized anxiety it could be um, you know separation anxiety it could be um, you know panic disorder those are all kind of under that umbrella of anxiety disorder so five and a half percent of just the general population of kids were struggling with this at that time in 2012 that number gone up to 6.4 percent and in 2016 7.1 percent percent and that's five years ago and and so we know that this is a growing concern we are aware of it um, and and so we need to be thinking about what's happening what what do we need to do to support our our kids um, here's some more um, data just about high school students so um, a 10-year trend so more high school students experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness from 2009 to through through 2019. Again, this doesn't even take into account the last year. And so it rose from 26%, one out of four of our, of, of our high school students experiencing those persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, all the way up to 36.7%, more than one out of three. So this is a major concern. Sadness and especially hopelessness, those are what, that's one of the key things that we're looking for when we're looking for signs of depression, is that feeling of hopelessness. So that's very concerning that this is, this is rising. The same data shows that it rose in both males and females. This breaks it down by gender. Um, and so you can see, you know, where it's it's typical for, for females to usually identify some of these more um, than males. But again, it's increasing. And so what is this and, and how do we support it? Um, this is also from this study from the National Risk Behavior um, Surveys, you know, all of these numbers are going up. So the percentage of high school students who experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness um, rose all, you know, up to that 36.7%. Seriously considered attempting suicide up from 13.8% to 18.8%. And so again, almost one out of five high school students reported seriously considering attempting suicide. Making a suicide plan and attempting suicide also increased. The number that stayed approximately the same was um, number of high school students who um, were injured in a suicide attempt that had to be treated by a doctor or a nurse. But, you know, it's, it's still increased, not quite as drastically. But we know that this is a concern. We know that this is something that we need to be looking for. Then, of course, came 2020 and the pandemic. And I don't know about you. <laughs> I think adults are really struggling as well right now with, um, you know, actually, as a matter of fact, I thought about it yesterday. Yesterday I had clients, I'm a mental health counselor, so I, so I saw clients all day. I had about six appointments, I think, that I saw yesterday. Every single one, some of them were students, some of them were adults that I was working with. 
every single one of them was experiencing intense burnout and just almost feeling numb. And I think really, you know, even though there were other things that were happening in their lives, a big part of that is just this fatigue and, and frustration and, you know, feeling like all of everything, all of the stress of the pandemic and the uncertainty is just dragging on. And so, you know, even though adults are definitely dealing with this, I know that you know this, whether you're a parent or an educator, you know that our kids are struggling with this too. Um, a, a survey, this was uh, conducted earlier this year, towards the, more towards the beginning of the pandemic, said that nearly a third of students reported that they were unhappy um, and depressed much more than usual than previously. Um, and 51% said that they felt a lot of uncertainty about the future as well. And so this was, you know, a, a major, you know, majorly impacting our youth. So this is, these statistics are generally about, you know, the general population. So let's now bring it back to talking about our gifted kids. Um, let's think about what factors of being gifted or twice exceptional influence overall mental health. I think it's really important for us to focus on the fact that the first thing is that advanced cognitive ability is an asset for our students. It is a good thing. It allows us to utilize tools and techniques. For example, I sometimes use cognitive behavioral techniques with some of my clients, and I can use them at a much younger age than, my, than um, I might with more typically developing students because my, my gifted and 2 kids ha can understand the concepts behind that. We can, we can dig into the, the science behind why certain tools and strategies might work to help handle mental health issues. And so we want to we want to harness that and use that as, um, you know, a, a strength. And, and, you know, there's so much talk about strengths based teaching and accommodations. And we want to really focus on those strengths and build from those. And so I, I think sometimes we pathologize giftedness and we really want to move away from that and focus on the fact that overall this is a strength. There are, of course, some other factors that influence this. So both an asset, but also perhaps a drawback is just that heightened awareness of the world. You know, um, if you have a child who is very curious and understands things and asks a lot of questions and, it, you know, just absorbs everything else that's happening with them. One of the things I see a lot of times with gifted and 2 kids is that they are unable to put things into perspective because they don't have the life experience behind them to put it into context. As in, you know, I got through this before, I can, I can, I can, or I handled this other situation this way, I can, you know, I know we'll get through this. They just don't have that, that, that long view of what's happening, but they have this very hyper aware sensitivity that can cause a lot of, um, a lot of fear and frustration. And, and sometimes they're concerned, like unable to really find ways to talk about it. Um, and so that's something that can be um, a risk factor. But the other part of it is it can also be an asset where, you know, it's good to be aware of these things. It can help them find a call to action, you know, that can help them feel like they have some autonomy and some ability to influence things um, in the world around them. Another um, factor that influences their mental health is in a, whether or not they are in an appropriate educational setting. If you have a child who is unchallenged, if you have a child who is twice exceptional and is not having their, any accommodations for their area of exceptionality where they're struggling, um, you know, there are many, many factors. But think about it. If you were in a workplace where you, it was just an inappropriate fit, you weren't having things, you know, you were either unchallenged or you weren't accommodated or whatever it was, and you were there 40 hours a week, that would be that would probably have a real impact on your mental health. So we really want to make sure that our gifted kids also have an appropriate educational setting. That's where they spend so much of their time. It's really important that they have that appropriate educational fit um, and, and whatever that might look like on an individual basis, because it doesn't look the same for all students. Kind of attached to that is twice exceptionality. So, you know, for two E kids, so it, just in case you're unfamiliar with this term, twice exceptional is a student who is both gifted and has another type of neurodiversity, um, usually diagnosed as ADHD or autism, um, dyslexia. Those could all be factors that might might fall into this two E um, uh, under this two E umbrella. But 
a lot of times our gifted kids who are twice exceptional don't have their twice exceptionality identified. They mask it, they compensate, they cover it pretty well. They're kind of white knuckling it most of the time and they don't always know exactly what's going on. But, but if it's unidentified and, unsu and therefore unsupported, that can also then influence that overall mental health. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we're on the lookout for this and that we're not afraid to seek out answers and, and information and diagnosis if necessary, uh, because, you know, that's that's how we get help. That's how we figure out, that's how we, you know, um, systematize all of these things and put them into order and, and figure out what steps we need to take to problem solve through that. So we want to make sure that it's both identified and accommodated in various settings. And another part is just feelings of perfectionism and imposter syndrome. I saw, I think last week, uh, Dr. Sikreski was talking about imposter syndrome, which is kind of perfect because, um, you know, that is definitely a factor that influences our mental health um, of our of our gifted and two kids, where it's like, you feel like perhaps the accolades that you have are unearned or you don't deserve them, or it's just all a show and people are gonna find out that you're a fraud or perfectionism. Like I always have to live up to this expectation. And if I don't, I'm letting people down or I'm letting myself down. Um, you know, it's hard for, for gifted kids when gifted kids are really young. If they're unchallenged when they're very young, they learn to assume that school comes easily. And if school is no longer coming easily to them, they kind of hit a wall, that kind of can really shake their, um, their, their image, self-image and how they really recognize that, um, you know, their academic success is not necessarily part of their identity. So we want to really help them understand and cope with perfectionism as well. Those are all just some factors that can influence those gifted and 2E kids. Another thing that I think is really interesting is to consider social media and screen time, which I know has been over the last um, year. <laughs> I think at one point, most of us, as if we're parents, just kind of threw up our hands and said, you know, we're in quarantine, you know, whatever. And hopefully, you know, things have kind of shifted a little bit. But, you know, here's my question. And I just want you to think, think to yourself, do you believe that the impact of increased screen time and social media use on kids and teens' mental health is mostly positive, mostly negative, or neither positive or negative? If you're brave and you want to put your answer in the chat, you can do that. But what, what do you think? How do you think it influences our kids? It's pretty interesting when you look at the research regarding social media and screen time. And part of, um, you know, there's kind of this assumption that increased screen time causes um, negative mental health effects. However, a lot of the research actually says, although it might correlate, it's not necessarily causal. So if, for example, you have a child or a teen who is feeling more anxious or they're feeling more depressed, they may withdraw into their phone more often. And so that increased screen time is not necessarily causing the anxiety and depression. It could be just a result of it. Um, you know, and, and ultimately, there is a lot of research that shows that there are positive pieces to this. I mean, especially through the pandemic, how did people stay in touch? You know, we stayed in touch through social media and screen time. So many of the, the activities and games that kids play are interactive, you know, where, where they really are socializing with their peers. And so I think as, as parents, you know, as we kind of try to consider what's that balance having a conversation with our with our kids and really helping them build a level of self-awareness how much is this helping you how much is it really causing you struggle um you know how do you feel when you get off of social media is it, it are you getting something valuable out of it or is it something that is bringing you down you know helping them learn to self-regulate that screen time these are all things that we can do because you know there there are benefits to screen time and, you know, I think that sometimes it's, it's so easy to, um, you know, want to cut all of that out. And definitely it causes problems. Trust me, I know I've got three kids, at, <laughs> three kids at home. And it's like, you know, I think that they would, you know, put their face in a screen 24 seven. And obviously, you know, if, if we let them and obviously that is not healthy for anybody <laughs> around the house. So, you know, we want to really think about that. But but just recognizing that you know, it's not necessarily causal as far as mental health goes and social media and screen time, but we want to help kids self-regulate that. So let's just chat about some of the signs of anxiety, um, you know, that we might really see in, in, in 
kids, you know, or signs of some depression. You may, may be familiar with these, but I think there are some that I'm going to kind of emphasize as things that are really good to look for when we're talking about our kids. So the first one is irritability or anger. Kids and teens are not always great at verbalizing their emotions. And so one of the outward signs that we will see of increased anxiety is an increase in irritability. Think about yourself. When you feel anxious or stressed, you know, you're, you're, you just have this, this low threshold for, um, for items and, and that might often come out as irritability. So that's a great sign to look for. You know, a lot of times um, I see kids coming in for what looks like anger or outbursts, you know, and really when we dig into it, it's really underlying anxiety that's causing them to have this increased irritability. So we want to look for that with, when we're looking for these signs of um, mental health concerns. Um, continuous feelings of sadness or hopelessness, um, you know, worthlessness or guilt, those are all really consistent. And I, I bolded that word hopelessness again, because that is one of the major factors that we look for, especially when we're concerned about any sort of suicide risk. That's a major um, a major factor that we consider. Another thing to remember, it says continuous here, but especially with kids and teens, um, and especially with our gifted kids and teens who can mostly hold it together, you really might see peaks and valleys of what appears to be sadness, and, and then times when they kind of get out of that and they seem like they're okay. Adults, a lot of times, when, when they are having really significant clinical depression especially, it, it really does you know, it's consistent and, and that, you know, lethargy or just, just overwhelming sadness, it really never, never lifts a lot of the time. Um, but for kids, you might see some more, some more ups and downs with that. So be aware of that as well. You know, don't rule it out just because you see a child laughing or having fun. Um, they, there could still be some other concerns there. Social withdrawal, you know, just, I don't want to be around anyone. I mean, it's hard with teens, right? Like they never want to be around anyone anyway. But, you know, what, what is normal for, the, for your child or, or the student that you're working with and has it changed? You know, we're always looking at those intra-individual differences and discrepancies. How does, it, how does it affect this individual child? An increased sensitivity to rejection. You know, any, any sort of mild criticism is just, you know, a dagger to the heart. It, it just is very hurtful, whether it's from peers or teachers or parents. That could be another sign, you know, um, again, with that worthlessness or guilt that can kind of associate with that and, and magnify those feelings for kids. Changes in appetite. So whether it's less or more, they're eating less or more, be aware of that. Um, changes in sleep. So whether they are awake all the time or just sleeping a lot and you know kind of watch for patterns because everyone kind of has some natural ups and downs with this as well um, so you know maybe it, it's going to probably be a little last a little bit longer than than just a you know a fluctuation within a few days vocal outbursts or crying you know increased tearfulness just about little things um, you know I'll share my my daughter my middle daughter she's a fifth grader and um, you know she deals with anxiety and and uh, you know, just to be very straightforward, she takes medication for it. And I have no problem with that. It was, you know, a hard decision to do that, but I think it was the right decision. But we can tell when that medication, you know, whether when she's kind of grown out of it or whatever, she just becomes very emotional and tearful about every little thing. And it's like, and, and again, that irritability really peaks. And, um, you know, it, and, and I know that that's not always common for her. So, so we watch for that for sure. Um, difficulty concentrating. And, you know, be really careful with this one because this could be a lot of different things, <laughs> but it is something to watch for. I, th I think a lot of times kids come in and their parents are like, well, I think they have an attention issue. You know, they can't focus. They can't pay attention. And again, is it anxiety or is it an attention issue? And it can be hard to tease that out, especially in our gifted kids, because again, they compensate, they mask. It's they don't always look like other kids might look. Fatigue and low energy, that kind of is similar to, to the increase in sleepless, uh, like increased sleeplessness, but not always, but just like flat. That's kind of that numbness that I was talking about, you know, that so many of us, I think, are experiencing right now. Um, just kind of feeling like, you know, the daily trudging going through every day. And it, it's just like hard to kind of amp up, you know, for, for anything. 
Um, physical complaints. This is another one that you'll see, especially with kids who are not great at verbalizing their emotions. And so they talk a lot about stomach aches or headaches, or they don't feel well, they don't want to go to school. Um, you know, something that is something to watch for as well. Uh, just a reduced ability to function, you know, during events um, and activities. They're just not participating as well or not wanting to participate at all. And then finally, you know, thoughts of death or suicide. Um, and I, I, I want to encourage you, you know, whatever your role is, whether you're a, a teacher or a counselor or a parent, you know, don't be afraid to talk to students and, and, and kids about this. This is a really important piece. And I feel like sometimes there's a lot of... Um, we feel very overwhelmed about having these very straightforward conversations about these topics, but ultimately that's how we help. And that's how kids know that it's okay, you know, to talk about those things. Um, and so we want to make sure that they, that they know this um, and, and are talking about it and that we're taking it seriously as well. I do want to touch real quickly um, just on understanding self-injury and suicidal ideation. So, um, there's, there's a difference between self-injury and self-harm, which is kind of, a, I don't want to, you know, kind of jargony within the psychological field, like what, you know, we use this different terminology. But so self-injury is typically non-suicidal. And so we actually call this non-suicidal self-injury or NSSI. And non-suicidal self-injury really is, in many ways, um, a coping skill a very maladaptive coping skill. It's not, it's not encouraged, but it is a way to either sometimes, sometimes people will describe wanting to, you know, um, they felt like they deserved it. They were punishing themselves or they just felt numb and they wanted to feel something or, um, you know, there, there could be a lot of reasons, but it's really, the intent is not necessarily suicidal. Um, you know, and so, self-harming really has more of a suicidal a, a, a intent even though even though the goal might not be to complete suicide um there is a little bit of a difference there so we kind of handle those things differently obviously if you're dealing with a, a kiddo who's who's you know cutting or whatever whatever it is that they might do that is definitely a sign to reach out you know and, and find some someone who is a professional who can really help assess that um you know and and make sure that they're getting the help that they need Suicidal ideation, you know, that can, there's a wide spectrum of what suicidal ideation really looks like. It can be something that is a fleeting thought. It can be very abstract. It could go all the way down to have, you know, if somebody has a plan or an intent, you know, do they have the means to do this? If you're ever concerned and you want to do a very quick risk assessment of whether or not somebody is feeling suicidal, the three main questions, you know, um, are you thinking a lot about death or dying? You know, can you tell me about that? Have you thought about how you would do that? Like, do you have a plan of any type? And then finally, you know, um, do you think you're going to do that? Like, do you have a do you have the way a way to do that? Is that something you have access to? And and do you have a you know do you think you're going to? Do you have an intent? Those three factors can really help you. I will tell you that again. Always ask for a professional for help, but especially for I don't know, I would say for all kids, but but for our gifted and two-week kids too, there's sometimes this knee-jerk reaction that anytime a child, um, you know, talks about any type of suicidal ideation that we need to go and and have them assessed and, uh, and you know, put in an inpatient, you know, for a few days. I do not recommend that. I really feel strongly that you need to take that on a case-by-case -case basis because sometimes that can be more damaging than helpful. Um, you know, and maybe it really is just getting more support and having a counselor to talk to or, you know, a therapist of some type. But, but you know, like I said, with that wide spectrum, it, it's not always, um, you just have to really take it and, and obviously be cautious. You know, it's better always to be safe. Um, but you know, don't always assume that that's that's the automatic response that you need to have. Oh, and how to assess? We we just kind of chatted about that. How to assess those three questions? You know, are you thinking about death and dying? Do you have a plan? Do you think? Do you have intent? Are you going to do it? So okay, now let's talk about how to help, and then we'll get into our Q and A. So here are some great strategies that I really like that are very easy to use. If you have a child who's just experiencing emotional dysregulation, it doesn't have to be anxiety or depression or significant mental health. These are just good tools and strategies to use. So the first part is really facilitating non-judgmental conversations about emotions. How do you feel? What do, what do you, you know, really trying not to 
Like here's an automatic response that I sometimes hear adults saying, and I understand why, you know, but someone's like, I'm, I'm feeling really sad or I'm feeling really down. You know, it's like, well, you know, just tell yourself, it's like, think about your life. You have such a good life. You have all these good things going for you. That while the intent is good, that's not always helpful. What we really want to do is we just want to listen. So tell me about that. What do you think about your future? How do you think, how do you think things might work out? You know, a great, um, a great tool that, that I love that actually I, I picked up from Lisa Van Gammert. She shared this in one of her books about perfectionism um, was, you know, uh, best case, worst case, most likely. So let's think about the situation that you're struggling with. What's the best case scenario that, what's the best outcome that could possibly happen? And let them go wild with it. What's the worst case scenario? You know, it's like a lot of times it's like, I'm going to end up living <laughs> homeless and, and living under, you know, whatever. Uh, what's the most likely situation? What's probably really going to happen? And kind of trying to find that middle ground there is really good, you know, but, but letting the kids lead the way and really not judging that, having that conversation and being really open about that. Normalizing showing vulnerability. This is key. We have to model this for our kids. You know, when we are able to verbalize our own processes, our own self-talk of how we regulate ourselves, I'm feeling really stressed out today. I'm going to go outside and go for a walk and listen to some good music because I just know that'll help me calm down and feel better about the day. Or um, you know, I'm really worried about this thing and I'm not sure what to do. And I don't like having this feeling of uncertainty, but I know that if I, you know, kind of just keep doing the things I need to do, you know, I, I can, I can get through this, you know, coming up with ways to, to model that for our kids is really key. We want to, them to know that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to talk to people when you're, when you're feeling, um, you know, difficult emotions. Increasing emotional literacy, especially for some of our very emotionally intense gifted and 2E kids, talking about emotions can be very difficult. So sometimes kids just have a hard time labeling their emotions. Other times it's hard to talk about because when you talk about those emotions, it brings those emotions up and they have such a strong affective memory. I don't want to talk about that uncomfortable thing because then I feel that way again. But we really want to help them learn the just right word. One of the key tenets of mindfulness and meditation is being able to step back and look at and look at a situation from the outside. And one of the ways that you do that is by labeling how you're feeling. Um, in the book, um, The Whole Brain Child, one of the strategies that they talk about is name it to tame it. If you can label that emotion, it actually helps you step out of it and then you can self-regulate a little more easily. So emotional literacy is really important. Another thing about gifted kids a lot of times is because they have a high, um, high verbal ability, they like to find the just right word. And so nuance is important. So, you know, you might do something like get out the, um, you know, get on Google and find the vocabulary of emotions. Or many of you have probably seen some of those emotion wheels um, that kind of had the tiered emotions, like from the very basic emotions in the middle, and then it kind of gets more specific. I actually have one of those right over here in my office in, in one of the drawers that I pull out a lot of times. Again, it's almost like a menu of options. Like, well, what, how are you feeling? Kind of use this as a tool to kind of, um, you know, find that just right word. Using realistic reframes of negative thinking. You know, I feel like positive thinking, um, well, if you try to talk to a, a gifted kid about using positive thinking, they're going to look at you like you're ridiculous <laughs> because they're like, well, positive thinking is silly because that's not, nothing's all, no thing's positive that way. That's just not how it always works, which, you know, to be fair, that, that's true. Positive thinking sometimes is like taking something like, oh, I feel terrible. I'm never going to get through this to, oh, it's great. I feel fine. I can do this. It's not the opposite. We want to find a realistic reframe. So, you know, I'm feeling really stressed and anxious about this situation. Okay. What's a realistic reframe? Um, I'm feeling stressed about this, but I know that I can get through it, or I know that I have people who support me, or um, you know, whatever the case might be, but just trying to find a way to put it into context that fosters resilience and also just has um, you know, some, some flexibility about what that outcome might be. Um, you know, and, and help kids know like it doesn't have to be like positive, it can just be realistic and neutral. You know, I think sometimes one of the things I see a lot of times with kids actually is this belief that if I'm not happy all the time, there's something wrong with me. Sometimes okay is fine. 
like neutral is normal. Like, like how none of us are happy all the time, but I think, and this may be an impact of some of the social media stuff and seeing people's highlight reels, but we feel like everyone else's life is perfect all the time. And ours is the only one that isn't. You really want to think about, you know, it's, it's really about, um, understanding that, that middle area where that's in between, you know, happiness and, you know, sadness or whatever it is, that's an okay place to be. Developing a both and mindset instead of either or. So when you're having a conversation with a kiddo and, and they're talking about, you know, it's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting bad grades. Well, I'm trying the best I can. You know, it's not an either or. It's not like you're, you know, you're either getting bad, bad grades or, you know, it's more like, yes, you are trying very hard. You're trying the best that you can and you can do better. Like those are not mutually exclusive. Both of those things can be true at the same time. And if you're curious to find out more about this, I would recommend looking into dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. They talk a lot about a both and mindset, which is a really useful tool. And then finally, um, using a, 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 if you're concerned, using a mood, uh, like an app to monitor mood and look for patterns. I love doing this with my bright kids because they love looking at the data of this. So I have a little screenshot here and a little video um, of an app called Dailyo, D-A-Y-L-I-O, that I highly recommend. It's a free app. I think there is a paid version. It used to be totally free. Um, but here's what I like about this. So first of all, it sends you a notification and you see those little emojis there. You can kind of tweak those and you just pick what kind of day you've had. And then you can choose all of these individual factors that you also want to include. And all you do is you just go through and tap on the daily basis, like what, what those, um, like what else was happening at that time. You can track how you're physically feeling. You could track migraines, you could track your, you know, your mood, you know, um, whatever it might be. And what's kind of cool about it is once you go through and do this, it gives you this, this, first of all, just this feed, but then a mood chart where it kind of shows you how you've been. It tracks all of your mood counts. It also correlates those activities with those particular moods. So you can really look for patterns and kids can go, wow, on the days when I have, you know, soccer practice or volleyball practice or whatever, I get really stressed out. And so what's that about? How can I target that? And so anyway, I highly recommend that app or there are a lot of others as well, but you can really, um, you know, it, that's a really great tool. So um, I think that that's all that I have as far as my presentation. Here are the podcast episodes that I mentioned that you might want to check out in my contact info. And I think we have some time for Q&A. I have many notes. <laughs> Uh, you know what I love about one of the things I love about these conversations is that I'm not only listening as a teacher and as a parent, but I'm listening to advice for myself. You know, had so often the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree, right? Oh, de and, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start off with a question that I had, and then we'll we'll let people write some questions in the comments too. Um, I love what you said about screen time and. Uh, engaging kids in a conversation about self-awareness and what they're doing and actually having that conversation instead of just, you know, keeping it all inside our heads or talking uh, up between spouses or whatever. Do you have any advice about like how to catch a kid when they're receptive to these conversations? Mm. <laughs> well, I wouldn't do it while they're on their screen. <laughs> That's probably not going to be the best time to um, to try to tr to try to facilitate that conversation. Um, you know, I, I I would hope that any time that you can um, have a conversation, and again, you know, there's definitely a culture that you can develop within your within your family or even your classroom. You know, what, whatever the case might be, about like let's just investigate this let's just look at, let's just consider this, you know, and, and framing it as a conversation, again, from that very non-judgmental standpoint, just a very neutral, like, let's, let's think through this, um, you know, and the more consistently you do that, the better it is. I find that a lot of times those conversations are great when, um, when you're in the car or when you're, or when you're doing something, because it, it kind of just allows a little bit more for that time. So, you know, you're sitting next to each other in the car or, you know, if someone's a little younger, maybe they're in the back seat. 
it's not quite as intense as sitting across the table from somebody and looking them in the eye. And so that can reduce, I think, the level of stress of just having those conversations for kids. And also remember that like it's an ongoing conversation. You might not come up with any resolution, you know, but it's like, well, let's just see. Let's let's let's, you know, I here's something I notice, you know, when I'm noticing that you're having, you know, using screens a lot. Maybe we can just watch and see if that's a pattern, you know. Um, but I think when we model that open mindedness and and recognizing that we don't have all of the answers, we're going to do we're going to let kids also then recognize that they don't have all the answers, which I think, especially for teens, it's like, well, they know everything, you know, so um, I, I would say that those might be some ideas to kind of consider. Thank you. I know this is a hard question to answer, but it's probably one you've been asked before, too. Uh, when do you decide to cross that line and go out and seek outside help? You know, when I've done this presentation before, I actually have a slide on that and I took it out so we would have time for Q&A because I had a feeling it would come up. Um, you know, it, it, if you notice that it's ongoing and it's not getting better, um, you know, if you notice that um, you are um, concerned and not quite sure what to do, you know, I mean, I have families come in sometimes and, and you know, we might just have a few sessions and I, more than anything, it's like I just kind of talk to the families and the parents and help reassure them that they're doing the right things. You know, if you're not sure, that's why we're here. That's why we're in this industry, um, you know, because we want to you know provide that support, um, you know, check with the school counselor. They're a great resource and they can definitely give, you know, they'll know some benchmarks, you know, and you can kind of maybe describe to them what you're noticing or what you're seeing. Um, like I said, I think definitely anytime there's any sort of cutting or anything going on, I think that's a time that you really need to just check in and make sure, um, you know, any, any time that there's, you know, significant suicidal ideation, like those are some real red flags. Um, but, you know, I also think, I also think everyone should be in therapy. <laughs> like, and so, you know, I mean, don't, don't, don't worry about like waiting till it's bad enough, like be proactive. Like, hey, I noticed some signs that my kids maybe experiencing some anxiety and stress about these particular situations. Maybe if they develop a relationship with somebody, you know, a mental health professional, that can be a resource for them that, you know, they might not need to see them every week for the rest of their lives. But, you know, you go and check in, you have some sessions, then you're doing okay. And then something stressful comes up and you go back, you know, and that's kind of a nice a nice resource to have and you're teaching kids that as they get older, you know, that is, can be part of their support network. As a, as a follow-up to that, one of our watchers is asking, do you have any tips for finding a therapist that a child clicks with? Yeah. You know what? I like the way that phrase is, is that question is worded uh, because the thing that is most important is that your child clicks with the therapist, that there's a connection and that there's a rapport that's built. A lot of times I get asked, you know, how do I find a therapist for my gifted or twice exceptional child? That is much harder. <laughs> you know, you can definitely search, look, there, there are some, you know, different directories I know that are available, um, but those can be hard to find. My thought would be find somebody, um, Psychology Today has a great therapist directory that is that has a lot of different therapists in your area. You can search by zip code, you can search by concern, and you'll read a little profile. You can kind of see, like, pick a couple, you know, call them, try to talk to them, ask some questions, ask if they know about, you know, giftedness or, or twice exceptionality, or if, are they even open to recognizing that there's something, you know, that how that might influence overall mental health, and then just go and meet them, you know. And I tell every single one of my clients that on our during our very first session, I'm like, if this isn't working, talk to me about it. That's fine. I'm going to do the same. If I feel like we're spinning our wheels, that doesn't make any sense for anybody, you know, to waste our time and not make progress. So we really want to make sure, you know, that that you're getting a referral to the right services. And even if the first person that you find isn't the best fit, maybe they know somebody who would be a really good fit and, and pass pass that along to you. Thank you. I had no idea about the Psychology Today resource. Yeah, it's it, well, I mean, to be fair, it, it's a paid ad like, you know, if you're a mental health professional, you pay to be on there. So it's an advertising. But but it is truly like everywhere I've looked. That's one of the most thorough yeah. areas that you can find it. OK. And if you're looking for specifically for gifted, if you look at sanggifted.org, they have a list of therapists. Emily is probably listed there. Uh, I don't think on this. I am. 
Well, you should be. <laughs> I know. I, I, I've, I've only printed out the paper and started filling it out about a million times. And I just, anyway, that's my ADHD. We'll, we'll, we could talk about that another time. <laughs> that's another issue. Um, I have a, another question from a viewer, and it says, do you have any books that you would recommend for their children to read? Oh, good question. Um, well, I know Free Spirit has a lot of like like gifted kid handbook or it's some called something similar to that. Um, you know, and those are some good, good topics, but those aren't necessarily related to um, mental health. You know, there are a lot of books. Um, I'm not going to remember what the, what the titles of them are, but um, one of them is don't let emotions run your life. And there's a whole, like, there's a whole series of these books, but they're almost like, they're like workbooks for kids and teens that I feel are really good because th they can help facilitate conversations, which I think is really helpful. Um, and, and they, they really teach some skills. So, um, I, I guess my thought would be, I don't, while I don't have, I don't remember, <laughs> remember the title of that series, what I would recommend is, you know, wherever you purchase books, go and search for, you know, whatever the topic is that you're seeking and look for that style of book, you know, a, a book that is more of a workbook style or has activities. That's a really good place to, to start. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I know you have to get to an, another appointment tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Story um, of my life. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to dominate. I'm going to ask this one. I host a, a, I host a group of parents and the, the topic is gifted children. I look on our comments on Facebook, all, all moms, mm -hmm. my group, 18 moms, two couples, one dad. What's up with that? <laughs> That's a great question. What do you think is up with it? I, I think, I mean, this is one of my topics. I wasn't trying to set myself up to answer. No, that's okay. I, I just like I just like putting that question back to people. <laughs> yes, and 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 I think we know that some stereotypical differences between men and women. And the boys when uh, literally do not have the language that little girls have in kindergarten and it takes them a couple of years to catch up to that. And I think in many ways that they never really do, uh, especially men labeling being able to find the language for emotions and mm -hmm. uh, just the practice and the comfort zone with having that. But I didn't ask, I wasn't supposed to answer that. You were, Emily. <laughs> no, I mean, I think you're right. I, I, I think that it's interesting. I think that a lot of times, um, you know, I've, I've definitely, um, well, I think that there's also a little bit of a prejudice even within the medical community where where um, professionals tend to, you know, I mean, here's an example. I'm a counselor. When I'm working, I am in sessions. I am unavailable to answer the phone. When the school wants to call, who do they call? They call me. My husband works from home. He's the one who's available. If my kid is sick, if they if they need something, you need to call my husband. and you know, so I think maybe that's maybe a culture shift that that we as professionals, as educators or, you know, counselors, whatever, that we can really help to facilitate by not assuming that that, you know, the, the mother is the person who we need to go to. Um, I think another is is just, um, you know, having those conversations within those relationships, you know, and, and, and coming up with a, a co-parenting plan and goal and talking about how important that is, because I do think that, I, I do think that um, the men that I know, I think they want to do better than how they were raised. I think they, a lot of them recognize how culture has changed and they don't necessarily want that for their kids, but I don't know that they always know exactly where to go with it. And so, you know, um, if possible, you know, taking that team approach, I think is, is, you know, um, a possibility or, or if you're a single dad, you know, finding some other dads who, who are, you know, wanting to be involved, I think is important, um, you know, in making those connections as well. Well, thank you so much. I have a lot of wonderful notes here and uh, the question always comes up. Uh, you can always refer back to our recordings, visit the coloradogifted.org website and 
find the conversations with CAGT. You can check the recordings. I like to go back and screenshot some of the slides. So I have that information at my fingertips, but thank you so much tonight for, for being with us, Emily, and uh, everybody, I, def I so recommend the Neurodiversity Podcast, and uh, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find it, and um, I have enjoyed it long before I knew Emily. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you again for being here tonight. Yes.